so uh, can I begin? Yeah. Hmm? Then you are, can you please tell me? Yes, yes, you yes, can. please. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, today I will tell you about uh, our ADNet project. And um, this is quite a challenging project. We started it uh, around a year ago. And the story of how we built everything and organized and found uh, team members and uh, our advising professor, who is well known theoretical physicist, is as interesting as the project itself. So maybe I will tell it later. Uh, in um, AGNS project, we are considering organism as a complex network system uh, that have uh, many uh, networks of different uh, scale that are interconnected with each other. So we can see that uh, inside our cells, there are genes and proteins and they work together and uh, the life uh, is, is exactly the product of this interconnection and this work. Then uh, we see that uh, cells themselves uh, connect with each other, then uh, cells comprise tissues and organs. And uh, finally, we see that phenotypic, uh, different phenotypic uh, features are also, uh, also influence each other. So here, um, there are also different examples of data that can be collected uh, to study different uh, layers of organism system. But um, on the picture, you see four layers, but actually there are many layers, uh, many, uh, much more than four, of course. And um, also, uh, when we uh, study this uh, aging process, uh, we see that there are different external forces that influence this uh, complex network inside organism. And this is um, an example of external forces, maybe diet, sleep, different medications, the change of environment and the social status and so on. And um, uh, so that, that's, um, that's the object that we are working with. And uh, now I will... Uh, tell a little bit about network theory. And this is a funny, but very um, good demonstration of uh, why we should really uh, study not only genes, but interconnections between uh, the genes and between other biological entities. Uh, because if you, for example, uh, have a Lego set and you want to really reconstruct a whole system, you, um, won't be able to do that if you have only bricks. So you really need to know uh, how they are linked, uh, how each brick is linked to others. So you need an instruction and uh, these links are uh, called edges. And only in that case, you um, will get a final system and you will fully comprehend it. So this is um, um, the, the same story is in genetics of aging. Uh, if we will study uh, molecules and genes separately, we will never understand how um, uh, how um, aging is looks like and what are uh, fundamental principles of it. Um, uh, these are uh, several questions that we address in our studies and uh, that are not solved uh, by today. Uh, the first one is nobody knows how to exactly how exactly we can measure this um, aging degree. Um, aging degree can be seen as the resource of an organism that is already spent. Uh, also, there is not only biological age, uh, but biological uh, biomarker of aging. Um, there, there is a kind of aging rate. So uh, as you can see, uh, different people of the same chronological age, they may have different biological ages and at the same time, they may have different aging rates. Uh, also, there are uh, different reports that different uh, 
people can age differently. And uh, there is a very cool article uh, written in 2020 about ageotypes, um, about uh, authors uh, grouped uh, different people according to their um, fastest um, phys physiological um, system in the organism, and they got uh, four uh, groups. Um, and uh, as I already said, that there is no common generally accepted uh, method that will allow us to measure aging rate and biological uh, uh, biological aging level. Uh, so uh, there are several, uh, there are a lot of attempts uh, to measure aging with uh, by methylomic profiles, and uh, there, are, there are three. Uh, generations of uh, aging clocks that do so. These are different algorithms that were proposed and uh, uh, the, they work quite well and uh, but uh, this is not uh, what we are looking for because um, no, there is no understanding of why uh, we can really measure, for example, chronological age with uh, by metalomes. And uh, uh, so this mechanism that underlies, uh, this underlying mechanism is not known. Uh, and also, uh, when we measure uh, chronological age, uh, and we, we create, uh, for example, models uh, and algorithms that will measure chronological age by uh, methylomic profiles, this algorithm will throw, throw away um, the sites that are responsible for the difference between uh, people that have same chronological age but different aging levels. So this is not uh, good for studying the principles of aging process. And uh, what we do in our project, our project have uh, two parts. Uh, the first part is um, imagine that our gene regulatory network have a particular structure and this structure can change uh, in the course of aging. So uh, we are looking for um, differences that occur in uh, gene regulatory network structure while we age. Um, and then we uh, do spec uh, we find clusters in um, gene regulatory networks and. Uh, we investigate uh, how uh, these clusters also change uh, during aging process. But another one, uh, another topic is uh, how different species um, or different human ageotypes uh, uh, how they are different in terms of uh, gene regulatory network structure. For example, you see that uh, we all know this example of a rat that lives uh, about two years and a uh, naked mole rat that uh, lives uh, about 30 uh, years and nobody knows its real cause of aging except some um, viral disease that uh, naked mole rat is very uh, prone to. Uh, so uh, we don't know uh, which uh, structural features are responsible uh, of gene network are responsible for such a long lifespan of very uh, close species. And so, uh, and also uh, we want uh, to find the, how aging phenotype really emerge uh, from a gene network structure. And there are uh, two very cool papers that uh, inspires us. Uh, the first one is um, how criticality of gene regulatory networks affects the result in morphogenesis under genetic perturbations. And um, this is very cool article that uh, claims that uh, oh, first uh, gene regulatory network operates in critical regime and um, they try to really find out how macroscopic um, features of gene networks arise from um, 
structural changes. And um, uh, the, 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 there is a, a second article where there is evidence that um, the huge change in lifespan of uh, different uh, species uh, is uh, uh, because of um, is uh, coming out of um, the change of gene network structure. Um, this uh, team uh, used uh, four types uh, of uh, uh, worms that have had a dramatical change in lifespans and they proved that um, th this dramatical change is um, uh, tightly connected with gene network structure. So um, the, there is also a very inspiring examples, uh, example of uh, apl application of network science uh, to brain connectomes. Uh, th this example is uh, very cool because uh, this uh, team of scientists for the very first time uh, found the real difference uh, between human connectome and other species connectome. So um, shortly speaking, what they did, uh, they had uh, data uh, for connectomes of macaque, and nematode and uh, two different uh, data sets for human. And they, uh, uh, at first, uh, tried to, um, they wrote an algorithm that transform a random network um, to a, a particular uh, network of study. And uh, they, uh, in, in this process of uh, network transformation, they used a different conservation law, uh, laws. Conservation, conservation laws is a restriction uh, that is applied to that uh, process of um, network transformation so that um, there, there are several restrictions that cannot uh, th that should always be followed and uh, the very simple one is vertex degree conservation is when a random network while transforming to a particular network not network of study uh, couldn't uh, change uh, the uh, de vertex degree of each um, neuron uh, while uh, being transformed to a, a network of study. And we see that uh, such a conservation law, um, when applied to this uh, transformation algorithm, it, and we see that uh, a resulting network uh, that we got from a random network is a uh, really close to a real connectome of macaque and nematode. And we see that uh, this is earth moving distance, a distance between uh, two networks, a, a metric for a distance between two, uh, two, uh, two networks. And we see that it's quite low in comparison with human. And we see that um, this uh, algorithm and this conservation law is uh, were not good enough for human. So uh for human they try they they additionally applied uh a third conservation law that is local clustering constraint simply saying it's um uh, the uh such a constraint that each uh, vertex um while participating in 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 different uh, triangles um the, the number of triangles that involved involved each uh, node uh, should uh, sh sh should have been conserved, and this um, th this was a big success because uh, we see that uh, uh, such uh, evol evolution process together with uh, two conservation laws, vertex degree conservation and local clustering constraint showed a dramatic change, change in results uh, for human connectome. And we see that it is approximated quite well and the distance dropped dramatically. And uh, for animals, it, it also, uh, we, see, we also see the improvement, but not so sharp one. Uh, so, and this uh, local clustering is um, very um, 
uh, is a discovery and is is a conservation law that is very special uh, exactly for a human brain and this is uh, very cool so uh, and we try uh, actually uh, we try to apply uh, very close methods in our studies to investigate gene regulatory network and i will begin with a very simple uh, thing um, this is adjacency mat matrix of gene network and how it is built for example, if we have a, a gene network, here I have chosen a small one with, with um, five very famous genes. And uh, this is an example of how they interconnect in human blood. Of course, these are relative uh, values, so uh, don't pay special attention to it. Uh, but um, adjacency matrix is the same as the network itself. Because on each square, uh, you, you see the square table, and uh, in each square, we have coordinates that correspond to gene names, and the, uh, in the intersection of the column that corresponds to a particular gene and the row that also corresponds to another gene, we um, have a number that is responsible for the uh, weight of the edge that connects these two genes. And uh, this weight uh, is the, uh, the the measure of how uh, the first gene can interact with another one. And uh, what I want to emphasize here is that uh, gene net uh, adjacency matrix for a gene network may not be symmetrical because one gene may influence uh, the second one, but uh, vice versa. The second one uh, may not be a regulator of the first one. And uh, so uh, we have understood what is adjacency matrix. And now we move to, the, uh, to our workflow of what actually we do and we did. Uh, the first step is data preparation. This is a, a, one of the most difficult steps because uh, now we uh, collect data from a gene expression omnibus uh, database. And this is a very tough project or process uh, because uh, different transcriptomic uh, uh, data sets are processed uh, differently, are normalized uh, differently. They have different platforms and to harmonize uh, to the process of germanization of these data sets and the process of the cleaning, uh, the process of the uh, analysis of the annotation of these uh, data sets is very uh, time consuming and uh, challenging. So this is like 50% uh, of our time. And uh, then uh, when we finally uh, get transcriptomic data, uh, for example, uh, blood transcriptomes of human, we divide this data into baskets. Uh, what is age basket? It, it simply means that uh, here uh, there are transcriptomic uh, profiles for particular healthy people that uh, whose age uh, varies in a short interval. And uh, for each age basket, uh, we uh, build adjacency matrix. And this um, we, we do this step with uh, different algorithms. At first, uh, at the beginning of the project, we tried Pearson correlations, simple Pearson correlations for gene pairs, and uh, we were building adjacency matrices according to this. But um, now uh, we have an uh, advanced uh, algorithm that fills the direction of interconnections uh, and uh, that, that, that is much better than Pearson. And I will explain it a little bit later. Uh, then after we got adjacency matrices, uh, we analyzed them with network theory. So we uh, find spectral properties, uh, compute spectral entropy. Uh, we, we study uh, if they, such uh, networks have uh, different conservation laws analyze eigenvectors and uh, analyze spectral clusters and analyze how uh, do genes uh, 
emigrate um, among clusters um, in aging cores. And uh, also uh, what we should do and uh, a very necessary step in this study is the verification of, the, of this um, networks that are built out of transcriptomic data. Because of course uh, we, uh, we should verify it uh, to make sure that this, is, th this gene network is really close to what really happens in the organism. And that we do uh, these different methods. At first we compare our adjacency matrices with um, known database of gene regulations. And uh, we also do gene embeddings and network embeddings to see how far um, genes um, are in, uh, how far networks uh, of different age baskets uh, are uh, between each other and uh, how far they are from real uh, gene networks that uh, come from data database uh, from databases and um, uh, then finally uh, after verification of networks and application of network theory we uh, get uh, spectral clusters and uh, we analyze them with different uh, uh, databases of genes and with our open genes database uh, to see uh, and to biologically interpret what we got. Uh, so uh, this is um, the data out of gene expression omnibus that we already analyzed and downloaded, analyzed and uh, did all the previous steps I have described. And um, uh, let's move to inferring of regulatory networks from expression data. Uh, as I already said, uh, first we did it um, by simply correlating two pay, uh, pairs of genes, and now we use a Gini tree algorithm, Gini tree algorithm, and we slightly change it. Um, and uh, now I will tell shortly about how it works and uh, what we change uh, exactly in this algorithm, and then move to the next uh, next more interesting part. Maybe uh, so. Uh, imagine that we have n patients and p genes, and this is our transcriptomic data set. So, what the algorithm that infer a gene relations do? It uh, hides um, it hides gene expressions one by one, and it constructs uh, learning samples of expressions of other genes, and. Uh, and then uh, it does regression trees whose aim is to predict the expression of uh, the, the hidden ex expression. And uh, when they do it, um, they acquire um, uh, genes that are, uh, they build uh, something like significance um, out of, uh, when they predict um, the hidden expression uh, out of this, uh, the trees, we can get significance of relation between uh, uh, regulators and between targets. And then uh, when we uh, obtain it, uh, we do interaction ranking and then we get our adjacency matrix. So this module, uh, this step, uh, now uh, in, G in initial gene tree algorithm, it is regression trees, but uh, we already tried lasso and uh, we constantly improve uh, this this uh, module to get better and more trustable uh, networks and uh, by uh, by the way uh, by this algorithm we get non symmetric non negative adjacency matrices and uh, i would like to also to mention that um, this is an open uh, our project is open of course and uh, this is quite a, a, an open question, so we uh, constantly think how to can we improve can can we really improve the prediction of gene relations? And if you are a data scientist who is interested in aging, so you can join us and propose your ideas, and we will try them, or maybe you can try them with us. And uh, then when we got our JCC matrices for different ages. Uh, we uh, verify our um, 
uh, our networks and uh, we try to see uh, genes uh, we try to do embeddings of genes and embeddings of networks and we try to see what really happens on the on the plane uh, to uh, to get understanding and to verify uh, whether our networks uh, are close to reality and this is the example of our gene embeddings for blood and for uh, skin uh, human skin uh, fibroblasts and we see a, a, a I have to say that this is only 5% of connections. So we extracted out of whole network, for example, out of whole networks for different ages in blood, uh, we extracted 5% of most uh, strong connections. And then we did, M uh, and then we um, uh, did uh, embeddings. And now you see that um, networks really rotate um, around a uh, center and for fibroblasts this is the same picture um, here are different ages so um, each each dot uh, here is a gene that uh, corresponds uh, to a particular network of um, and the color is the age of this network and uh, we investigated this center and we discovered that um, we investigated two very small uh, radius, radiuses and uh, we discovered that at fir that first around 30%, uh, th th there are 30%, 30% uh, of all genes here are common between all networks. And these genes are quite, uh, are housekeeping genes. So, uh, they uh, these genes in the center belongs to uh, fundamental living processes without uh, which uh, an organism can will simply die very fast so th this is these are very fundamental biological processes uh, very basic ones uh, without uh, which we just uh, can not, not live and uh, then uh, we come to uh, uh, do a network analysis of uh, our adjacency matrices. And uh, uh, we at first applied uh, a spectral analysis of uh, our, our networks because spectrum of the uh, network and uh, of the matrix of the adjacency matrix and of the Laplace matrix that uh, can be computed from adjacency matrix are really uh, fingerprints of the network. So uh, mm, we can restore and we can speak, mm, we, we can restore the network by its spectrum. So we see that uh, how such spectrums looks like. Uh, as our networks are not non-symmetrical, uh, they also have a com complex part, um, which is not shown here. And uh, here are how uh, here are densities of our spectrum spectrums. So um, here you can see the different uh, spectrums for different human organs and for fly, and uh, each uh, line corresponds to a different age. So we see that spectrums really change. Uh, which is very fun and very, um, it is an unpredictable, it was an unpredictable result because uh, we also measured the mean uh, degree of vertex in each network, which uh, wasn't changing at all. And we also measured uh, mean uh, age uh, weight, which also was, um, stable across all ages and at the same time we see that spectrums uh, uh, spectra changes uh, change dramatically uh, what uh, and the same picture uh, actually uh, appears in connectomes um, so uh, what uh, that does it say us we see that um, gene regulatory network is robust enough to maintain uh, main functionalities, uh, but at the same time, 
it uh, flexibly reacts to different uh, perturbations and it flexibly changes according to aging or process. And then here are spectra of uh, Pearson, uh, of um, uh, adjacency matrices that were in, built with Pearson correlations. Um, they were symmetrical, um, but we re refused uh, to uh, to stay with, uh, we refused to use Pearson correlations for inferring uh, gene regulations because um, we couldn't acquire clusters in uh, uh, such networks because uh, we got only one huge clusters, uh, cluster that contained all genes. Um, and also when we computed spectral entropy, for example, it wasn't changing also. And we concluded that probably Pearson correlations cannot change non-linearities, non-linear processes, and they are not uh, good for such kind of study. And here are new spectra of adjacency uh, um, matrices of human uh, blood built with Gini tree. Um, by the way, this spectra were acquired, um, this spectra uh, correspond to Laplace matrices. And Laplace matri uh, matrix can be acquired from an adjacency matrix. And this uh, spectra are for adjacency matri matrices. So we see that they also change dramatically. And this orange, uh, these are different ages. And this orange part correspond to, uh, this is a discrete part of a spectrum. Here we can see different ages and we see the change. Uh, and uh, let me explain more about uh, this discrete spectrum and uh, why it is very meaningful and why do we study exactly this part of the spectrum. Uh, so we see that um, these eigenvalues of the discrete spectrum are called isolated eigenvalues and there are uh, several mathematical um uh, facts uh, for example uh, we know that the discrete part of the spectrum uh, shows the existence of clusters in the network and the number of clusters coincide with the number of isolated eigenvalues and also uh, we see uh, after uh, uh, after analysis we understood that for example for blood networks there are uh, both clusters in the network and there is a uh, non-clustered part of the network. And this is the evidence that network simultaneously reacts quite flexibly to perturbations, but uh, it is still quite robust. And maybe this is a sign of um, critic, uh, functioning near critical point, uh, which we have to prove. Uh, so, um, also, I, I want to mention uh, that um, it is only on a picture, it, it looks easy, but um, actually the process of um, acquiring this discrete spectrum is very tough. So we were, this is another uh, quite um, uh, very serious um uh, the, 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 it was a very serious problem for our physicists uh, to uh, uh, find um, an algorithm and to find a way how to really get this discrete spectrum out of whole spectrum. For example, why we didn't take these points that also look like isolated eigenvalues. So this was a very tough part that we uh, overcame together and uh, I'm very happy with it. So um, now this is a very cool picture that we got just several days ago. We see that uh, if we count number of clusters, which uh, and this number uh, equals to number of isolated eigenvalues in each spectrum, uh, we see that this number of clusters uh, drops uh, with age. So this is very unusual and we really have to interpret uh, this result. So 
uh, we for blood uh, for blood uh, we got different networks for different ages we clustered them with spectral clustering and now we got a um, result that the number of clusters drops with age and now we analyze the migration of genes uh, between clusters during age and analyze gene groups that are um, inside each cluster and this really can tell us a lot about aging process and this uh, so now we are doing it just just now currently and also i, I would like to uh, mention um, two interesting works uh, because what we will do next for example if we get all the clusters if we interpret them biologically uh, now uh, we plan uh, we then plan to uh, move to a con construction of a model of actual model of aging and, uh, and in recent two years uh, they uh, they appeared several works that uh, claimed that probably, a biomarker of aging and the aging process could be described with uh, models that use term thermodynamics. And the, the first work uh, is uh, the work of Giro company. Uh, they uh, investigated uh, methylomic profiles and at the same time, they uh, had data on EMR, EMRs, electronic medical records. And uh, uh, they came to a result that uh, our sites, our in our metallomic sites, can be uh, grouped by fastly uh, changing and uh, slowly changing ones, and that uh, human uh, can uh, during aging process. Uh, the dynamical fluctuation uh, depend on biological uh, um, and biomarker of aging and uh, human uh, uh, organism can be stuck uh, in the metastable states across uh, the life. But at the same time, when fluctuation uh, grow uh, to a threshold, uh, we see that um, this um, the organism is no more in metastable states and it, it just ages and then uh, go to death state and uh, here uh, was used uh, the, the, this group um, tried to uh, build the Hamiltonian of the system and use thermodynamic potentials uh, to describe it and uh, the second work is um, an attempt to investigate the aging of uh, naked mole rat because a naked mole rat doesn't uh, sh demonstrate the visible signs of aging and even uh, that doesn't demonstrate any phenotypic uh, and more complicated signs of aging like in blood tests we don't see how uh, naked mole rat uh, age and uh, Vadim Gladyshov um, counted uh, Shannon entropy uh, for di different uh, for naked mole rats of different age, and he also got uh, the result that uh, entropy grows, and this is a sign of information loss uh, during aging process. And uh, what we can do, uh, we also can uh, count entropy, and there are a lot of methods that allows us to count entropy uh, on uh, based on uh, spectrum and based on uh, uh, spectral clusters. So uh, now we are developing methods. The complication is that uh, all these um, mathematical objects like clusters, uh, Laplace matrices, spectrums are developed for uh, particular graphs and to adjust uh, them uh, very accurately to our adjacency matrices that are non-symmetrical and um, uh, to just to do all the mathematical steps very accurately is very difficult. So um, we quite to define uh, all these objects like entropy uh, and so on. Uh, we uh, uh, spent uh, quite a lot of time 
and to because everything should be defined very accurately and anyway yeah and this is our this was our attempt to count spectral entropy on laplace uh, spectrum uh, and do we we got the, the change and do we got the growth for blood uh, and now we are analyzing two um, two ways to do this um, more accurately. So yeah, uh, thermodynamical um, model of aging is of high interest because it it could uh, offer us a very cool biomarker that would um, really measure the resource resource of um, the spent resource of an organism and their health status and the uh, other uh, very important um, values uh, that could uh, and such a biomarker is really needed to uh, improve clinical studies because now uh, we don't have a tool to uh, to estimate the effect of a drug that is meant to be a longevity drug for example yeah, and that is the end of the presentation. Thank you very much. And uh, I can answer questions. Let me just come to the beginning of the slides. Yeah, thank you. Yes, question. You uh, ah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think my question is: uh, this, uh, um, is it is it so important? Is it, is it of great importance to consider uh, these networks, these networks like uh, adjacency of similarities, uh, not non-symmetrical similarities between genes? Is it uh, really in the in the, in the mm -hmm. base? Uh, yes. Uh, thank you. Uh this is a very good question yes it is very important because in biology there are genes that are regulators that can regulate others and there are genes that are just targets and uh, we cannot the, 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 this uh, division uh, between targets and regulators is plays crucial role in uh, essential uh, for example pathways so we cannot uh, ignore it. Mm. Ah, okay. But uh, but um, uh, when we when we consider the problem of, but, but, if I if I have understood correct, uh, uh, the, the the problem of interconnection between uh, this uh, inter genes or similarities or in, in, in some connections between genes and the problem of aging yes there are some relationships how so in other words how these you know, networks of agency, adjacency metrics or networks affect affect uh, the age yes so, how does, so I, I think in your in your uh, uh, here in, in your analysis you you, you have considered Mm, some maybe unsupervised un un problems, as, as I understand correct, yes, unsupervised, yes. So, so, so the, the, the age uh, was not a target variable, yes. So the, mm -hmm. the problem was not like a problem, like the problem of to to, to find some uh, the most important genes that affect the age. Or that affect the biological age, for example. So this is a, not a problem of feature importance, for example. It's, 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 so it, mm -hmm. because generally the, the, this was not a problem of supervised learning. Yes, you consider some problem of clustering, spectral clustering. So mm -hmm. uh, and spectral clustering is a problem of unsupervised learning. Yes, you, you cluster your genes using non-symmetrical in, in your case matrices, and then you. So, in a sense, mm -hmm. you made some you made some uh, some conclusions about how these clusters uh, uh, are connected with uh, with aging. Yes, with aging, you found some yes. decrease in the number of clusters with age. But is it really is it really a, is it really a 
uh, uh, does it reflect some law, some fundamental law? Maybe, maybe it simply um, reflects uh, the fact that uh, with um, that the differences between clusters uh, uh, degenerate, and the clusters um, uh, connect connect with each other. So the the differences between so first maybe in the for 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 small ages we uh, the differences are high and so we have a lot of a lot a lot of clusters and with aging so there are uh, many mm -hmm. many small clusters uh, merge with us with each other in other words and so we have. So the, 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 yeah, the, yeah, this is yet to be studied. So uh, yes, clusters can interconnect. And actually, if we see spectrum, if we look at the spectrum, um, they, it is not such a way that uh, each cluster correspond to each isolated eigenvalue. So uh, there is a, like superposition of a clusters that correspond to each isolated eigenvalue. So yeah, clusters can interconnect with each other. And this is exactly what we study now. So how, what really happens with these clusters and what happens with genes inside these clusters and probably how can we explain it from the point of view of physics? Yeah. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe to use maybe hierarchical clustering. <laughs> maybe this, uh, no, this is just a dream, sorry. Uh, this is just some some thinking th thinking to to the space. Um, okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Nastya. There are also several questions uh, on YouTube. Uh, should I help you read them out loud? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So uh, yeah. I probably will read two uh, together because they might be interconnected. Uh, First, uh, David Katz is asking how close uh, to being symmetric was the adjacency matrix. And then Alexander Benchin is, ask, is saying, shouldn't it be 100% symmetric simply because the transcriptomic data doesn't tell you which gene influences which? I don't understand the, where that symmetry could mm -hmm. come from in the data. So what about mm -hmm. the symmetry? Okay. Uh, so yeah, this is question about the symmetry of uh, our JSNC matrices. Yeah, ninety-three uh, percent is the measure of uh, symmetricity of the average measure of symmetricity of each matrix. Uh, uh, yeah, it's ninety-three percent. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, actually, this non-symmetric feature comes from from Gini tree algorithm that can feel it, and it was proven. So uh, initial algorithm win the Dream4 challenge. And this Dream4 uh, is a famous data set on which uh, different like algorithms that infer causality relations are trained. So uh, yeah, we can, uh, there, there are uh, uh, some, we believe that out of transcriptomic data, we can really ex extract uh, non-symmetrical relations. Uh, all right. Um, so Nicola Markov is asking, uh, what was the connectedness measure of your gene networks? Connected, it, I, I, I cannot say you the, the exact number, but uh, actually all networks are very dense. And it was a real problem. So they are dense and uh, that's why uh, analysis of Laplace matrices uh, was very tough. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, by the way, David, uh, Alexandra, Nicole, you're welcome to hop into, into Zoom and ask directly uh, while we're still airing, if you're, if you're here with us. Also, uh, there are uh, questions in our chat here. Uh, Alexei Alexeyev is asking, uh, well, he's saying thanks for presentation. How many samples were used for different tissues? And uh, you probably were using the males and females samples differently or not? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so uh, thank you for the question. Uh, here is a full chart of uh, data properties that we used. So uh, around 25 samples for each age basket uh, was used. Uh, 
So what is what was the end of the question? Uh, sorry, once again. Um, you used male and female samples differently? Ah, yes, uh, we, we used male and female together. Uh, but now we have another data that um, the, 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 where we separated it. Uh, we is, is, with this data we use male and female sim simply because it is very difficult to find big size of uh, data sets uh, for a particular um, gender. Uh, all right, uh, Daniela, are there any questions? Well, Alexander Panshin is saying. I still don't understand how can non-symmetrical relationships can be extracted from transcriptome data. Can you give an example where this is possible? Maybe not from the uh, world yeah. of gene networks. Um, yeah, I can repeat. It's simply it's simple. So uh, the algorithm um, is uh, it looks like uh, that. So we, uh, in our data set, what we do, we hide this um, expression uh, of a particular gene. And then we try to predict this expression. And while we do that, uh, we uh, see, uh, we consider uh, this gene as a target and other genes as regulators of these particular genes. And uh, using ensembles of regression trees, we can uh, extract an importance of this influence of each gene uh, to this particular gene that we have hidden. So yeah, um, from the definition, this algorithm will really measure, uh, uh, will really create non-symmetric adjacency matrix. Mm. Um, yeah, uh, probably. Okay. I, I hope, I, I hope it answers. Yeah. Um, okay, we'll hear from. Yeah, we'll hear from Alexander later. Maybe, uh, maybe not. Uh, so Michal for Nikita is raising his hand. Nikita, uh, thank you, uh, Anastasia. Uh, the picture of a spectra of adjacency matrices, imaginary part of uh, eigenvalues decreases and even vanishes uh, with the increasing of its absolute value. Uh, yeah, this picture. Uh, how can I explain it? Mm -hmm. uh, can, could you please uh, repeat? Uh, um, what should I explain? Um, imaginary part of the eigenval uh, eigenvalues mm -hmm. decreases and even vanishes uh, with the increasing of absolute value of uh, eigenvalues. Uh, so what's the reason for it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the reason for it is that the discrete uh, part of the spectrum doesn't have an imaginary part. This is the property of a discrete spectrum. Mm. Okay, thank you. And this is uh, based on this, we developed our algorithm of uh, separation. But actually, this is not um, working in both sides. So if we just uh, see on each, uh, no, on each dot here and just remove all um, eigenvalues that contain imaginary part, we will be left with, um, uh, what we will be left with is the part of, is still a part of continuous spectrum with a discrete one. So um, th th that's why this is very complicated to just uh, get only a discrete part. Mm, yeah, and, and we have spent quite a lot of effort on it. Uh, and uh, is there anything more about uh, the lack of uh, um, uh, the comparison between the amount of um, the eigenvalues with uh, negative uh, with negative absolute value and uh, uh, its uh, positive part is quite big? Uh, what's the reason for that? Um. With the real part, with, with, the, with the part of uh, the eigenvalues with the uh, uh, negative real part is much mm -hmm. uh, yeah, is yeah. less than uh, the part with the positive part. Actually, this is yet to be studied by us because by now we only uh, uh, we, we only um, 
learned how to get these discrete parts and uh, learned how to get clusters for these discrete parts. So uh, there, what happens in continuous part and why does uh, this spectrum look, looks as it looks like, uh, we should study, yeah. Thank you. Mm. Any more questions, guys? No? Okay, since that, so we don't really have any more questions, Anastasia. Uh, do, do you maybe have anything to add yourself? Mm -hmm. um, was, yeah, I, I want to add that we are inviting uh, the, the data scientists to join us to really uh, brainstorm what can be uh, done here to improve our gene networks because this is a and now we are writing um, a, two articles based on that call work and based on this exact method so uh, everyone can join and call for be a call for with us wonderful uh, yes uh, co-authors co-researchers are welcome uh, Thanks a lot, Anastasia. Uh, that was very interesting. Um, Thank you. Hopefully, we will have more lectures with you soon, uh, covering like some more details of your research work. Um, and you also, you know, promised us the interesting story uh, of how the, uh, the yeah. project. I appeared. can tell it now <laughs> if you want. Uh, only if you feel uh, feel for it. So yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, the, the thing is that uh, if you, if you want to now end, I can tell it next time. How? Well, no, how, yeah. How, maybe next. Maybe like next it? time. And also, uh, maybe yeah. Next time, okay. Yeah. And also, Alex uh, uh, checking uh, is asking, can we get this presentation? Uh, yeah. Well, first of all, the the slides, um, the video will be there mm -hmm. on our YouTube channel, so we'll be there at least. I think uh, the presentation itself. Uh, I, I will not upload to the uh, group because now we are doing some preprints and so on. So the graphs, uh, I, 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 the team would feel better if I don't like download all the pictures directly to the chat. But of course, uh, this uh, video will be on our YouTube channel. Uh, all right, uh, of course. Uh, and also we'll present the, the results on our uh, pages on our website as soon as they're ready to be presented. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, thank you, Anastasia. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today.